to the people of God, for the word of God by the Spirit of God, to the people of God, of the Son of God, Jesus. This book can be that. This church can be that. Where you attend on a normal basis can be that. You could be alone all by yourself with not even looking at a video or looking at any kind of smart technology and this could be the day the Lord has made for you. Because you see, it's not about church. It's not about religion. It's not about relationship. It's about you. About you and God finding intimacy and finding intercourse to become a relationship that God and man becomes one. And that is what God intended from the beginning when He called Adam by name and raised him from the dust and placed him in the garden in order to tend the garden, but to also have fellowship. The things that aren't recorded in the Bible per se, but that the Spirit of God will give you understanding if you would but read it the way He would give you understanding to live it. You see, God visited Adam in the cool of the day. God obviously didn't need to visit Adam. God didn't need to come in the cool of the day. But God gave space for Adam to enjoy the garden and to tend it as he would, according to that which was in Adam's mind, even as God had intended for Adam to be. Adam spent time with God. We don't know how much time, we don't know how little time. We only know that after a matter of time, God created he male and female, and male and female did he create them. So he took a rib from Adam, and he fashioned Eve into being a helpmate for him. So that the two would become one flesh, and that they together with God would be what we call today marriage. But back then would have been called the unity or a pattern or a typology of that with which God is. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the three in one. That, in reality, is what marriage is all about. It's about a type, a image, a very much allegory, simile, and metaphor of God and the Godhead Himself. Being that man is not in charge, woman is not in charge, but God is in charge. And if you saw it as a triangle, then you would see that if you were at one end of the triangle, going uphill, at the other end of the triangle, woman going uphill, then somewhere you would meet in the middle when you got to the top. In other words, when you become one with God, you become one with your mate. It's not just a physical union, it's a spiritual and a soulful union too. So the reality of what marriage is, is threefold, not twofold. For a twofold cord is, or threefold cord is not easily broken. Two are better than one in that if one falls down, yeah, pick the other up. But guess what? God in creation created everything in threes. So the reality of what we're talking about, the reality of what we're living about, is what are you doing about you and God? You may be married and you may be placing your children above your relationship with God. You may be in a job and placing your job above God. You may be in a sports event or a sports type of environment where you call that your job. Although playing a game is an interesting way of earning a living. At least I think it's kind of interesting. Because you see, while the world may look at it and elevate it as being some kind of sports hero, God looks at the heroes of being those that are raising children, that are raising ministers, that are raising ministries, that are raising people, that are doing what God said to do in the beginning. Now, what happened after the beginning is that man began to learn his own way of thinking and his own way of doing and began to do his own thing. So God sent prophets, God sent his word, God sent kings, God sent priests, God sent all kinds of people to tell them what God was saying. And in some ways it became diffused. It became filtered down. The diffusion became confusion and gradually man lost his way. So eventually in the fullness of time when man had determined that he himself was God-like, even as you hear of the Caesars in the Roman Empire, God sent his only begotten son into the land that should have recognized him, but even as Jesus said, light had come into the world. 
But men recognize not the light because they love the darkness more than they love the light, lest their deeds be revealed for what man they were. Because once you stood in the light, you went, Oh, look at me, what I am. And they recognized they were sinful. They knew they were naked and open before God, just like Adam and Eve. You see, people that came into contact with Jesus suddenly had a reality check. Oh, oh, uh-oh. They knew deep down inside, even as the demons that were in the pigs knew, that this was someone different. This was someone unique. This was a unique and distinctive person that God had come in the flesh. And now here is the creator of the universe, the co-heir of all things. Well, the heir of all things, but we be co-heirs. That Jesus himself being in the flesh, being the son of man, epitomized of what man should become, not what man had done. Because Jesus demonstrated what man should have done in the death that he chose to offer as a living sacrifice to God. Because he became the sacrifice for sin and God raised him from the dead. Because of the obedience that he went through, God honored him. God blessed him. God called him and said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That is the type of person we want to be. That is the unique, distinctive person that Jesus is. That is what John in the Gospel of John is talking about. And that is what John, being the Baptist, was preaching about. That there should come one that would baptize those in water, that would baptize them in the Holy Ghost and in fire. Because you see, once the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's just like running into Jesus. The Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. The Holy Spirit reminds you of the sin that you're in. The Holy Spirit tries to take you to a place where you would have a relationship with God, but you choose not to. The fact that you don't know God or you don't hear God isn't the Spirit of God's fault, but rather our sins have separated us from God. We're not willing to yield ourselves to the leading, to the filling, to the abiding in the Spirit of God. Jesus said that it would be such so in the latter days that when the Son of Man returns, would he find faith? And I know that when we look at religion, we say, well, of course you can, Jesus. Come over here. I want to show you something. Do you see Calvary Chapel? Now, come on over here. Do you see one billion Catholics or more or whatever it is? Come over here, Jesus. Do you see Protestants? I mean, come on now. Let's get real. Like, do you see the fundamentalists? Do you see Christian America? I mean, Jesus, don't you know you will find faith? Really? Then why do you say it? You know, when John came preaching, he came as a man that had separated himself from the world. He had decided and looked at the world, and from the moment of his birth before he was even born inside of his mother's womb he came into contact with the son of God you see the baby left in Elizabeth's womb and left for joy and then she prophesied of what Jesus would be and Jesus would do but John inside kicked at the right time or in this case as we discovered the first Pentecostal was born yeah John left he jumped for joy because he came into contact with Jesus. You could call him the first Pentecostal. You could call him the first Pentecostal preacher as he later on became a preacher and he kind of got carried away and lost his head over his message. Or, you know, you could not go with that humor. But the reality of what John is, the reality of who we are, is the fact that John was sent by God to preach and to baptize. And so John fulfilled his destiny. John fulfilled his ministry. John did what he was told to do. In the beginning of the services today, we talked about that at the sunrise service. How God sent John. We talked about how John was sent by God and how we need to be sent or we need to discover who is sending and are you sent to do something and who is sending you and who is God and what is God. For we talk about salvation in the sunrise service. So we know that we discover that we have to be saved in order to have a relationship with God at all. So we must 
discover what salvation is and what are we being saved from and what are we being saved to. And it's not just a question of being saved from hell and being saved to heaven, but salvation is to have a relationship with God Almighty, our Father, and with His Son, Jesus. And that is what God intended for us in eternal life. So the salvation, propitiation, atonement, and sacrifice that Jesus did accomplished demonstrating the mercy of God, the love of God, the grace of God that's been extended towards us. And in the second service, we discovered and uncovered that we must be not only born again, but we must be led by the Spirit of God. We must be filled by the Spirit of God, lest this book simply be dead works and we become religious and not someone who has a personal relationship. Listening to God, hearing God, and seeing God move. I can tell you right now that there are angels sitting here and you are unawares of them. Even as there may become people coming to your door, knocking and wanting to come in, and you say, oh no, you're one of those members of the cult. Oh no, I don't want to talk to you. Oh no, I don't want anything to do with you because, uh, hey, you know, you're one of them. And Jesus said, hey, don't do that. Even if it was an enemy, give them a cup of cold water for you heat fiery coals upon their head. Be nice. Be generous. Be faithful. You see, the faith that Jesus was talking about with the Son of Man find faith when he returns is that obedience to what Jesus has said. And I can tell you this. Christianity today does not do what Jesus said. If you can tell me and show me one instance where God killed someone in the name of God, then I'm all for you. But Jesus did not die in order for you to kill someone. Jesus died in order to save a soul from hell. And that soul is yours and that soul is mine. And the soul of every enemy that you have on this earth is, except for, you know, the spiritual beings. But besides them, every physical being that is a son of Adam, that has been born of the womb, in reality is the person you were sent to. Just like John was sent to preach repentance so that they would be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, so too are you. But you're beginning to become more, and we discovered that in the second service, that being led by the Spirit of God meant that we become sons and daughters of God, not like John the Baptist, and get involved in all these issues and causes that we talked about even in the sunrise 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock service. And in the 2 o'clock service, we said how easy it is to get sidetracked, to get distracted, to get attracted to, oh, we got to stop abortion. Oh, I'm sure you're going to do that by, you know, trying to tell people to make it illegal. Oh, we got to stop, you know, political irony or political sovereignty or political, you know, infidelity or political maneuverings or political parties or political people that are doing things we don't like. Oh, I'm sure you're going to be able to stop that. Oh, we got to stop, you know, ISIS. we got to stop Syria. we got to throw this dictator out in order to let all the people fall apart so that they can become ISIS, like we did. ISIS is the result of our American actions, our foreign policy inaction. We created a vacuum and we made ISIS into what it is today. And we let it happen even as we have done many times in the Middle East and as we have done in many countries around the world. So don't think that it's some kind of vacuum that suddenly these guys came out of nowhere. No, we did it and we won't admit it. That's the fact of the matter when it comes to American policy. But you see, as a Christian, we don't get involved in that because this is not our home and we are not in an American kingdom that we set up as the kingdom of America or the United States of America being democracy is the end result of what God intended for mankind to be. No! We are told to use this opportunity because God shed His grace upon this land because we reach out with the gospel. We send out with care and compassion. We are the ones that go there in order to be there in the name of Jesus. It's not about a Bill O'Reilly fight to say, oh, well, i got to make this righteous cause to fight for Merry Christmas. Oh, well, i got to fight for this other cause in order to be, you know, part of Christianity. After all, you have to be a conservative in order to be a Christian. No, that's not true. Jesus was one of the most liberal people I ever met. And at the same time, he was one of the most conservative people I ever met. And at the same time, he goes beyond conservatism and he goes beyond liberalism because he is God in the flesh. 
Got news for you. There isn't anything more liberal than God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the most liberal statement I ever heard of. Wow. Everyone, anyone, anytime, anywhere, any place can get saved. Because God said so. Not man said so. So we discovered in those services, even as we did in the five o'clock service, that there's a little more to John the Baptist. There's a little more to John writing in the Gospel of John to us about John the Baptist. There's a little more going on in this story than meets the eye. There's a duality or there's a, a spirituality, there's a mysticism of that with which is being said that we apply to ourselves so that the Spirit of God could use it to make it applicable to our lives. Are you sent, as we've been discussing all day long? Sent by God? Sent by your own lust? Sent by your own ego? Sent by your humanism? Sent by your own idealism? Sent by your spiritualism? Or are you sent by God? Or are you just sitting? We talked about the 5 o'clock service, how I've been sent. I've been sent here, in reality, to be a part of what God is doing in Utah. There's a great, well, great revival. I always hate it when they say great revival. You know, the greatest revival in Jerusalem had, okay, they said, you know, so many thousands got saved in one day. Yeah, but how many really? I mean, how many is that out of millions? Small percentile. And the reality of the historical records that are recorded for us, it isn't that big a splash in Jerusalem. I'm sorry, but it wasn't that big a deal. Other things were happening. Thousands could die in the arena at the same time that we're talking about the book of Acts when Peter preached and thousands got saved. We like to say in some ways that all these great revivals that we have now, whether Billy Graham or Greg Laurie or whatever it may be, oh, look at all the people that are coming forward. Yeah, but look at how many people are there tomorrow and the next day and the next year. How many really? Or did they just hit it up again and again and again and again? Well, we're just renewing, you know, so we're just going to go through it again. Just, just to make sure. Got to make sure I got my stamp year after year after year. New uh, bumper sticker. New, you know, tag for my hat. New Christian cruise to go on. So when Jesus says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? The question is, is it his faith that we find? Jesus denied himself, took up his cross, and he followed after God and died on the cross so that we may live. What are you willing to do? Are you willing to do the same? Or are you living after your own flesh, after your own lust, after your own pride here in America? You know, the world could be saved. Right now, we could personally, if we did what Jesus said, to just one of our neighbors, everyone that's a Christian did it to one of their neighbors, the world would get saved. That simple, that easy, that reality that would be positive, that would have an effect on people's lives. But you see, we're not doing what Jesus said. We're not loving our enemies. We're not loving our friends. We're not loving our church. We're not loving our pastor. We're not loving our president. We're not loving our politicians. We're not loving our country. We're saying we do, but as soon as something goes wrong, what do we do? We yell about it. We scream about it. We fight about it. We argue about it. We blame everyone else. Look at the woman you gave me, God. Adam said to God, and God said, Yeah, dude, I got news for you. I want to talk to you. And Adam was cursed, as well as Eve as well as the earth, as well as creation, as well as what we're living in right now in this nation. Because we're not under a blessing, we're under a curse. Oh, God has still shed His grace, and God has put a place upon this land we live in where we can experience these environments with which He still operates. But i got news for you, the Spirit of God is pulling back like the tide is going out. Step by step, the Spirit of God is stepping backwards and people are drying up in their relationship with God. People are yielding themselves to the anger, to the frustration, to the aggravation, to the violence, to the politics, to the issues, to all the other things in the world, rather than giving in to the love and the peace and the joy that God wants us to have when He returns. When the Son of Man returns, will He find faith, Jesus said. And I can tell you this, hell no! Hell no! I came from the Jesus movement. 
I don't see churches meeting Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and maybe five times on Sunday. I don't see that. And yet where I came from, the Jesus movement was all about that. And when we couldn't get enough of that, we were meeting in the homes even more so. And I went to seven days a week in the Jesus movement, meeting with other believers, with other Christians. I went to Melody Land. I went to Full Gospel Businessmen's Association. I went to the Christian... Well, I didn't go to the Crystal Cathedral, but I prayed for the Crystal Cathedral. I prayed for TBN. I prayed for PTL Club. I had to remember what it was. All of them. Because it wasn't about separation, it was about congregation. And it was about all of us reaching out and celebrating that Jesus is coming again. Will the Son of Man find faith when he returns? Hell no. He won't. So we need to repent. And that's what John the Baptist was preaching. And that's why we're talking about it tonight in John chapter 1 verse 6 when it says... God sent a man, and his name was John, because John was preaching repentance. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, who warn you about the judgment to come. Woe to you, Calvary chapels, that are off on a tangent, that are denying even Chuck Smith and his teachings that he brought to us. Woe unto you that have gone after you know, false idols. Woe unto you that have vineyards that have been given such grace and mercy that you have brought back into the fold. Woe well, unto anyone or anywhere that any place that we choose to deny what Jesus said when he said, Look, don't go criticizing your brother. Don't go fighting with those that God has anointed. Don't go picking on those that have chosen to follow after God, whether it be an Osteen or a Hagee or whatever it may be. I got news for you. I got questions about what they believe in. But hey, Jesus said, No, back off, Jack. They're mine. Well, I look at the book of Revelation and I can understand how I would say that. He'd say, well, you know, if you're going to that church, blessed are you if you overcome. And if you're in Joel Osteen's church, blessed are you if you overcome. Or some of the other churches that say they know Jesus. Will he find faith when the Son of Man returns? No, he won't. Because we haven't done what Jesus said in the first place. Make the reality of his statements the reality instead of interpreting them and trying to make them fit in some kind of OIA or, you know, how we observe it, you know, and then we, you know, investigate it or we look at it, you know, and then we apply it or we, you know, find the context or, you know, all the different ways that we've been trained to study. I got news for you. If you can walk away from what Jesus said and join the military and kill someone, you are Christian. You are ungodly in what you're doing to the Word of God. You are treating it as trash because Jesus said, Love your enemies, and there is no absolutism that allows you to go out and kill someone instead. None. The church died that we might live, and now we live, and they're dying watching what we're doing. It's like, what are you doing? You're killing the ones you're sent to. My God, how can we be so blind? And so we see in John chapter 1 verse 6 that God sent John the Baptist because the nation needed to repent. The nation needed to fall on its face. The nation needed to be baptized. The nation needed to turn to God because it had turned away from God and God was dissatisfied with the nation. I got news for you. Tell me how you feel about Obama and I'll tell you whether or not you're a Christian. It's pretty simple. Well, you know, and as soon as you say, well, I got you. You got it. You're right. There's your love. Superficial at best. What if Jesus said, I got pale, your enemies? Whoa, no, Jesus. Sorry, we can't do it of our own accord, but maybe with Holy Spirit's help, we might be able to. Well, that's a nice cop-out, unless it is about what you're doing, loving your enemy. Then you say, yeah, you know, I really couldn't do it myself, but now that God is in me, you know, it's becoming easier. You know, I'm actually praying for them, and I care about them, and, you know, God bless us. Or are you? You see, I like to hear Christians tell me about their world vision. You know, you have to have a proper world view. Well, I got news for you. There's only one world view that is proper and scriptural and biblical, and that is God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life, and God sent you out there to proclaim it. There is nothing more about a world view you need to know or do except that you are meant to go out with the gospel and to preach it and to teach it and to live it and to die for it. 
even to the sacrificing of your own life. That's what Jesus meant when he said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? And I can tell you one last time before I go. Hell no, he won't, because we are doing what Jesus said. And if you are, then God bless you. But I got news for you, the majority are. And we, as a nation, need to repent. John chapter 1, verse 6. That should be a reminder to us, that should be an inspiration to us, that should cause us to come to a place to say, God, forgive me, God, help me, God, hold me, God, bring me to you, because God, I can't do it of myself. I am a violent man, I am a sinful man. We as a people are violent people, we are wealthy people, we are rich people, and God help us because we will not be saved unless we repent and turn to you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, with all of our being, and with the fact of the reality of admitting that Jesus said, no, you cannot take up the sword and kill. You are meant to love your enemies and to die for those who will not bear, will not find heaven except that you give them the message that Jesus sent to give, even if it costs you your life because you're going into eternity. And that is to save a soul from hell, you're willing to die that they might live. I hear music and laughter just outside of my door. This time it's just a little louder than before. I hear Jesus making promises that I must now claim. They tell me once your heart's there, you'll never. My mind on hope, my heart, my soul in faith. I take the step that time cannot erase. Stepping into the sunshine out of the falling. They tell me once you're...